Okay, it is officially time to begin reading and studying the classic work of J. Gresham Machen, Christianity and Liberalism. I've already done one video introducing the book and its history, and another video on several of its key themes. If you've watched those videos, you are ready to read. If you don't have a copy yet, you'll find a link to the text in the notes of this video. Here we're going to focus on chapter 1. My plan is to make a video like this one for each chapter of the book, so 7 in total. Each video will have three main sections, a summary of the main points of the chapter, a few comments about the context and Machen's way of thinking, and then finally uh, we'll end with several study questions. After reading the chapter and watching the corresponding video, be sure to share your comments and questions about the chapter below. I'd love to make more videos to answer your questions and provide any more detail. Be sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss them. All right, so without further ado, let's start with our outline. We can divide chapter one into three main sections. First, Machen introduces the concept of liberalism. As I've said in other videos, liberalism in this context is not a political term, but rather a theological school of thought. Machen argues here that it is essentially naturalistic and that its growing popularity is a direct result of the optimism of the era. Scientific advances and expanding human knowledge make older knowledge and traditions less fashionable. This leads us to the second subject, a discussion regarding the apparent conflict between science on one hand and religion on the other. Liberals, out of a desire to ensure that Christianity and science can coexist, downplay the distinctives of Christianity, like the deity and resurrection of Jesus, to avoid conflict with the scientific, anti-supernaturalistic spirit of the age. Machen proceeds to argue that this surrender of true Christianity reflects a mindset that foolishly overvalues the achievements of science. The great material advances of recent years, Machen argues, have been paired with a cultural and spiritual decline. He particularly sees this decline in human freedom and in the standardization of education. Okay, so now a few comments on the historical context and and so forth. So let's first start with that question we mentioned earlier about science and religion. So science versus religion. Unlike Machen's modernist or liberal opponents and even some of his conservative allies, Machen allows for no separation between science and religion. He says that if we distinguish the one from the other, as we might distinguish fact from ideal or matter from spirit, uh, will lead only to skepticism. Instead, Machen argues that there is only one truth, and that therefore true science must agree with true religion when the latter deals with facts. So, if biblical Christianity is true, then its claims that Jesus died, was buried, and physically rose from the dead are facts that are subject to scientific investigation but cannot be controverted by true science. As Machen explains elsewhere, true knowledge comes not only from scientific observation, but also from the testimony of trustworthy sources. If biblical revelation comes from God, the knowledge it imparts is just as much true knowledge as anything that science can produce. All right, second, second topic here, legislation about education. Now, for today's readers, perhaps the strangest part of this chapter and even of the whole book is the several pages that Machen devotes to criticizing education legislation in the 1920s. There are two examples in particular, bans on the teaching of foreign languages and a ban on private schooling entirely. Uh, that These don't really seem to have an equivalent today. We're largely unfamiliar with these controversies because they were resolved by the Supreme Court uh, shortly after this book was written. Meyer versus the state of Nebraska overturned Nebraska's foreign language law in 1923, and Pierce versus the Society of Sisters annulled Oregon's prohibition of private schooling in 1925. Despite these outcomes, though, we should not dismiss Machen as an alarmist. The laws that drew his ire here were enacted in response to societal and political upheaval that had already resulted in no fewer than four constitutional amendments being ratified within the previous decade. At the time, no one knew if these anti-education attitudes were eventually going to prevail in American society. 
For our third topic, let's take a look a little bit in a little bit more detail at Machen's views of public education. We see in this chapter uh, his aversion toward public education, which may be off-putting to some, but there are three grounds for his negativity. First, the centralizing and standardizing influence of government. Second, the expanding use of novel pedagogical methods that emphasize self-discovery rather than teaching information. And third, the destabilizing influence of a secular curriculum on children being raised in the church. As an alternative, Machen advocated the formation of private Christian schools. Covenant children, he says, are best nurtured when God is recognized as the source of all truth and the entire curriculum is based on Christian convictions. He calls on churches and individuals to support the endeavors, uh, to support these endeavors for the sake of American society and especially for the propagation of Christianity. All right, well, let's wrap up with some study questions. First, Ask yourself, what does Machen mean by liberalism in the context of this book? How does he define it? Second, what kind of Christians will be rightly impatient with this book, according to Machen, and why? Third, how does today's postmodernism compare to the focus on scientific and material achievement in Machen's day? And fourth, what are some contemporary examples of utilitarian and standardizing tendencies in our society? All right. Well, I hope you read the chapter that, uh, that I, and I hope this video was helpful for you. Feel free, as I mentioned before, to leave any comments or questions in the area below, and we'll look forward to seeing you in chapter two. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks.